Well, a very warm welcome to all our viewers. Thank you. We have once again Father Ronnie D'Souza with us, a Jesuit uh, the director of counseling. And uh, he's very happy to answer our questions regards faith matters. So once again, I request you that if you have something that is bothering you in terms of our faith, please feel free to send us your questions. At the end of this program, you will see our email address. Please send us those questions and Father Ronnie will be delighted to give you a clear answer of what you should do and what you shouldn't do. So today we are discussing about some matters in the Bible. And Father Ronnie, I straight away want to uh, ask you this question. Why is it important that Catholics believe in the written word in the Bible as also in the traditions of the, of the church? Okay. Why is this so important? First and foremost, the Bible itself, we have got it because of tradition. When Jesus was preaching and teaching, maybe Matthew was writing, but he didn't write it at that time. Similarly, also maybe Mark may have written, but it would be later on. Because these things were taught by the apostles, they were handed down by their teaching. And these were take, uh, taken by the others until they realized the apostles were dying. Therefore, we've got to put down this in writing. So the written word came much after that, even in the Old Testament for that matter. They were handed down from generation to generation. And that was what we call the tradition. Similarly, also very much so in the church. What was the teaching being held in the church and all? And then what was written, what, we, what happened to be written after that regarding the early church itself, the Acts of the Apostles. Because you have the epistles of St. Paul, which are earlier than that of uh, the Acts of the Apostles. So the Acts came later. Now, these were all handed down by people. So, tradition is very much associated with, with uh, the word of God. You cannot say only the word of God. I mean, the word of, how did you get the word of God without tradition? So, but for the church, this is very important because the handing down of the teachings of the church from the early fathers and the others are also as important as the teachings, because they are not contradicting this. They are really emphasizing or um, putting the direction in, in the way it should be understood. So there we have it now. Because of our early, early history, where there was no written word as such, so tradition became very important. And therefore, slowly, slowly they realized that the apostles were going away, either martyred or whatever, and somebody had to keep on telling the world more about the Bible. And therefore, tradition is part of our history, part of our religion. But Father, uh, there are many controversies about tradition. And one other thing that uh, the Protestant tells us that, oh, oh that is tradition, that, uh, that cannot be true. So can you give us some ex significant examples where there is a difference of opinion between the Protestant church and us and yet, those traditions are terribly important to us. Now, one of the things is the books of the very books of the Bible itself. All right. You have we the Catholic tradition and the Catholic Church and the Catholic tradition. I would call it has eight books more or seven, which are two books. I mean, uh, Maccabees one and Maccabees two. That's why two two. So seven books extra more than the Protestant Bibles. Okay. Now, the Protestant Bibles, had, the reason for this is they were the Bible because of in the third century before Christ. Since the people had already been taken into exile, many of them forgot when they were there in exile, they forgot Hebrew. So, the question of the word, word being read by the people was beginning to get forgotten. So, they were uh, scholars who knew Greek and the language being spoken that time because Alexander had conquered that area was Greek and what is colloquial Greek, not the, not the high scale Greek as you would call it. So, this colloquial Greek was translated, they decided to translate the Bible, the, the Hebrew Bible which they knew very well and they had with them, they translated into into the Greek. 
but they also translated in some other books which were there at that time which were considered wholly accepted by the by the by the teaching authority of the hebrews also but not the original the signal. so therefore the hebrew bible you have the protestant version completely these extra books which are there have been that by the catholics now not because the catholics want even today the protestants accept the the book of thing not not exactly they don't do they call it the apocrypha for that matter today if you were to see when people ask me father what bible should i take i said today no no why you can take any bible no difficulty because today the translations are done by catholic and protestants together so before there was a time when catholic scholars were not allowed to translate books excepting what is known as the vulgate which was not just the greek but the greek which was made into simple latin which was ordin- which ordinary people would use and that's why the word vulgate vulga vulga mm-hmm. which today of course has got a different yeah, meaning right, yeah. but the vulgate was only that was allowed to be but there were scholars remarkable scholars you know you may have heard of a person ronald knox and ronald yeah. cox both of them brilliant scholars but they were not allowed to to go to the original greeks greek all right now today the church not only allows today there is a fostering and today the bible which are being translated and which we have the most modern bible are done by joint catholic protestants yeah. from that point of view. so therefore coming to your your point about it we can you bring point out something now regarding for instance purgatory now that you don't have it in any other book but excepting in the book of maccabees to be praying for the dead the protestants say that listen once you the person is dead is finished no you can't pray for the person at all on the other hand in the book of maccabees is told they were praying for the dead and that's why they said you you catholics are taking that other thing the what is important is the question of is this praying for can we not pray for somebody who has gone on for they will say no they will say not you you once he is dead is finished you can pray for him as long as he is there or not the catholics believe and we catholics do believe that we can pray that the lord in his mercy and kindness will remit not the question of if the, <coughs> if the person has chosen chosen to deny god in other words that that's finished you know the person who can be in that sense you know not purified enough for we would they would agree with that we cannot be going to the lord without being totally purified but that totally being purified according to them would be different we would call it purgatory now referring to that and therefore praying for the dead in that context of it okay but this is one of the one of the ones i would give it to you well uh one good news or to father ron is uh, clearly told us that you don't have to worry about choosing the bible nowadays you just uh, take the bible that suits you and the uh, the words that are made easy for you to read and understand so that is the now about tradition i think uh, father ron has made it amply clear that in the maccabees there is a reference to purgatory and the protestant don't believe in purgatory purgatory as such so but we do believe in fact we offer masses for our uh, dead uh, loved ones so that should continue because that is part of our traditional bible so it is not uh, it is it is in our bibles catholic bibles it is not in the protestant bible but the chapter remains there and we believe in that uh, particular uh, chapter so please don't worry about which bible you are reading you are not committing any fault of your own because all the bibles are written jointly by the protestant and the catholic scholars so there we have it so abundantly clear and uh, can i add one more thing you have now modern bibles which have the protestant version plus what they call the apocrypha okay and that apocrypha has got the catholic version all the right, okay one. well uh this is an uh, for me it is an unusual question but it's a question nevertheless uh, there are so many uh, incidents in the bible where uh, people like including uh, mother mary's joseph 
uh, had dreams. Yeah. Now, why is it that dreams play such an important part in the life of a person, even in the old times? Not even in the old times, especially in the old times. Uh -huh. See, at the moment, uh, today you may say, uh, you're doing psychology and psychiatry and such thing. You will be able to go and interpret dreams and such thing there. God used to speak to the people that time. When you understand, see, uh, look at primitive people, I would not be able to tell them something about um, astrophysics or something like that. What are you going to do? Or like talking to a kindergarten kid. And you have to speak language which they will understand. So the language they would understand was, was the question of dreams sometimes. When they would be, sometimes the king would dream about, you know, we've got to go to that other place and we're going to go fight again. Now, in those days, that was a thing considered common. Now, we are aware from what is our own biblical knowledge of it. God has spoken to, he spoke to Abraham, he spoke to Isaac, not so much Isaac, but about Jacob. Jacob, several times, you know, and he spoke through dreams. Because would they be able to kind of be able to encounter the Lord in that with those days of where God is somebody is terrifying and frightening, we can't live if we've seen him at that time, would they be able to? So he met them in their need, in their situation. And that is what the point was. Joseph, that he had to take Mary and didn't, or he was doubting about it and he didn't have to, he didn't want to take her. He honestly believed that she has, I am. I don't want to get her killed because yeah. she would have got her killed. He could have got her killed, but either I'll put her aside quietly. And the way it was done, if just you, just since you brought the topic, would be he would marry her next morning to divorce her. Right. So in other words, he would be free from that point of view. But on the other hand, the mother and child will be saved. That was the point. But even, for example, the kings. Yes. They also had a dream that uh, don't go the same route you came, take another route. Yes. God speaks, spoke to them in that way. Now, they may have had dreams. I don't know if they had, but they were seeing stars. They were looking at the stars. And for them, that was the one, the way God was speaking to them. Now, when they came here to... to um, to, to Herod, Herod, he was confused and he went and asked these people and they told him about it. Now, when they began to come in, they be realized that God is speaking through somebody that is the star. They saw the star. When they got out of Jerusalem, if you read that text there, they got out of Jerusalem, they saw the star. Before, as they were coming into Jerusalem, the star blanked out. Right, yeah. 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 Then they saw, so they realized God is speaking through us to some sign. And they all had the dream. Do not go back okay. to the heaven. Well, there you have it. Uh, we, Jesus, uh, I mean, the Lord uh, God our Father was very, very clear how to communicate to people in the old times. Right. And one of the mediums he used was dreams. And therefore, we have to accept that the old times are different from the new times. And therefore, it's, uh, it's, it's accepted. No, not only that, but I would say even if in the modern time, God speaks to us, he could be speaking to a dream, but yeah. th this has to be authenticated yeah. by the church or something yeah. that way. We'll be able to. Again, Father, in the Bible, uh, we have so many instances where Jesus himself uh, has driven away the evil one uh, in many, many cases. And uh, the person who was uh, troubled was back to normal. We don't hear too much of that happening uh, in modern times. What, uh, what, uh, in fact, uh, there's an example of Jesus sending 72 disciples two by two and said, cast away de uh, demons and, and uh, teach the gospel. Yes. So, uh, why is it different today? Well, uh, one explanation is today because of science uh, they're advancing and people not attributing all diseases to demons this is one thing so you people have begun to believe in understand that not everything can should be attributed to a demon 
But what has happened from what, what you are mentioning is it has gone swung to the opposite extreme where we don't believe in demons at all. This is not wrong. This is not right. What we have to believe is not everything, we put everything to the devil. No. He is responsible. This is one thing which we need to understand. The devil or the evil one exists in the world and he is definitely using his powers through people, through the thing. You can see it in, in political power and such thing where they exercise demonic power as such or nearing demonic power. However, as I said, don't attribute everything to the devil. That is what we call demonic power. power of, yeah, yeah. Now that is what it can be. Oh. And we should be doing it more and more, asking the Lord to re relieve us from these things. Yes. That I think we priests need to be doing more about this. So this is, this is precisely my question, Father. Uh, I, I don't see many priests forget about doing it. They don't even talk about it. So uh, mm -hmm. it appears to me that uh, they either do not have that power what was given to the apostles and disciples later on to do it and they did it. But now we don't even hear of it except in some missions where they have a deliverance and that kind of no, thing. No, but I don't think, I think we here there will be two points. One thing what you said about namely that uh, priests are not talking sufficiently about it and all. I wish we would be talking more about it. But I think what you said about uh, it's only on missions and all. No, I don't think so. I think also when, when somebody comes to me for counseling or the other and I say, has this been done? Have, have you been doing this thing or that thing? I ask the person. Can you just stop this this particular thing, which is, I do believe you're going to and you're allowing yourself to be caught up in this? Well, to put it, well, put it very concretely, I give you an example. Somebody is saying, Father, I tried my best. Father, I want to be a good person. I really want. I say, but you try, at the same time, you're saying you want to be also watching pornography. <laughs> Can you hold a... Uh, millstone now around your neck and then go from here running there. How can you go do that? This is what you're doing. So you have that demonic power which is holding you back to this thing. The Lord can break this. Can you ask the Lord to break this? This, what you call a habit. This is, I'm not referring to once in a way, it's something may happen. Or, I'm referring to the habitual attitude of, I can't help it. This is not true. You're not a slave. You are making yourself and saying, I am a slave. And it is not true. God, is, if you believe that Jesus Christ came, that he came to save me, I am not a slave. So, uh, there we have it. I mean, it is true that priests are not pushing this uh, uh, mightily enough. But even if you are troubled and you go to a priest for your confession right. and you tell him clearly what is ha happening to you, and he tells you to leave aside this particular demonic idea of yours, of an ad addiction or whatever, and you will be freed because the Lord knows that you are, you are trying hard and he is there ready to help you. And you want to be free. You, and, want, and to you be want to be free. So absolutely go for it and uh, do not uh, be afraid that, uh, that uh, the, the, demon, the demon is troubling you too much. Okay, another thing that is quite, uh, we hear quite often these days, Father, is some sects believe in what is known as born again. Now, w what is this thing called born again and why has it suddenly mm -hmm. generated such a lot of... Uh, I, I, uh, I, wouldn't, I would like to, to accept the fact that it has to be born again. See, I was baptized as a little child. Similarly, also, when I made my confirmation, I may have been grown up a little more. and think, But I need to really uh, say, Jesus is my personal Savior. I've got to accept this, that Jesus is my personal Savior. My sacraments and all are very are going to be assisting and helping me. But they will help me as much as I cooperate. And therefore, my acceptance of, of Jesus as my personal Savior, therefore, that can... And so being born again, I see no problem about it at all. And by being born again is not a question of being baptized again. I am already baptized, but now I am very clearly saying, I accept Jesus as my personal Savior. I surrender my life to Him. Now, in this, 
Now, sacraments and all are building me up also very much. But um, or if I have the external sacrament, but there is no acceptance on my part, or there is a closed attitude on my part, it is not going, to, not going to be helpful at all. The born, born again comes in where I am personally accepting Jesus, have accepted once and for all, where I, where at any time, sometime or the other in my life. Could be at my confirmation, could have been at my confirmation. But I would say, I have understood it, although I was confirmed, I was ordained, and I was living as a priest, I realized that I needed to be making very definitely repeating again now. Yes, Lord, I want you to be my personal savior. I surrender my life to you. So it was in that sense deepening my priesthood also, but it was growing in, it's not a question of that I've not done it in the past, but it is now in, in, in I really, I, this question of when they were talking about this word, when you were saying well, born again, I agree with that from that point of view. But it is not a question of saying, you know, I've got to be baptized again. That I don't agree with that. I am baptized. I am in the, in the Catholic faith. But I have got to be making, accepting this personal thing of Jesus, my personal savior. Yes, that yeah. So there we have it now. Father Ronnie has clearly explained that to be born again is nothing wrong with it. Absolutely nothing wrong. So you have to be born again because you were baptized as a baby. At that time, you didn't know anything. Even your first communion at eight or nine, you may not understand everything what's happening in communion or confirmation for that matter. So it is important that once you understand that Jesus is our personal savior and he is there ready waiting for you to say, yes, I am with you, come, come, come. So he is inviting us. So to be born again, if somebody asks you, are you born again? Well, yes, I'm born again, but from the way you are putting it, I don't agree. But the way I'm putting it is, I am born again when I truly and truly believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And I need to pray and pray and pray so that we work as a team rather than as if we are two different bodies. Mm. So thank you very much, Father, for that explanation because it was bothering me also because I said, what mm. is this thing going on here? Now, Father, one last question. I don't know whether we have time to handle it, but uh, let me ask it anyway. The, in the old days, even the apostles were married. Yes. Now, why has the church come down so heavily on our priests to be uh, Celibate. single? Celibate. Why is it so? And and uh, we have had so many scandals of this thing all over the world. And it, it uh, we we as Catholics are a bit embarrassed about all this. So yeah, yeah. Uh, why why are we so stringent about? Uh, no, I would not be the best person to answer because I am a religious. So by a religious meaning to say is even if I was not a priest, I could have been a brother, I will have to be fo following. Because it's, my religious life asks me, do you want to follow Jesus completely like Jesus was from that point of view? And that means a total commitment very clearly. It's not that I don't believe in marriage, I don't believe in love, precisely because I believe in love. I don't want to be committed to just one person, but to be available for others from that point of view. This is the same for the diocesan priest also. But as I said, you, you said about this thing that it causes scandal for. The reason I believe, very honestly, what is the reason for a scandal is because before it was not known so much, or maybe have not been this thing, uh, so so openly known about it by many things. Today it is known, it is a factor. But if you look at the number of people or number of priests or whatever who have made a mistake and done something which is bad and whatever, compared to the number of priests that exist, and you look at the, the number of people who are married and have their own problems in their marriage way, and the, and the people who are married on the other, the proportion is much less. I think Father has put it very di diplomatically because I think uh, if you look at statistics, so, uh, it is clear that the numbers that have uh, decided to go and get married is, or even uh, uh, not even married, but uh, do something which uh, is yeah, bad, yeah. Uh, sexual problems uh, are much much less compared to uh, what is happening in our married world where uh, divorces are, particularly these days, are multiplying by, 
like nobody's business. In fact, mm. you must be knowing better than me that sometimes uh, married people who are just six months, one yes, year yes, yes. Uh, into marriage, are already saying, I want to divorce. So it is the love that the priest has for Jesus. It is the love that he wants us to, the priest, to reach out to as many people as possible. Not tied down priest, to one. The priest. Not and tied this, down uh, to one. This is where he gets the strength uh, from Jesus and uh, he continues, though it may sometimes be very difficult, yeah. but uh, God is there. So, thank you, Father Ronnie. It's uh, very interesting to hear uh, all these questions that keep coming up. So, once again, I ask you uh, people, Please uh, continue to send us your questions because I'm sure that many of you, children ask a lot of questions to parents and sometimes they are baffled, they don't know how to answer. So put that question to us and while we, we have the next session, uh, you, you will be able to tell the uh, child, listen to what Father Ron is saying and you, uh, they, they will get their answer. So thank you very much for listening and Father Ronnie, thank you for coming over thank and you uh, helping us to understand our faith better. I hope we can be, uh, and I do hope you all will have some questions because we would really like to, I'm not saying I, fully, I may adequately answer it, but I'll try my best as far as I can to answer these questions. Sure. Right. Thank you, Father. Yes.